The book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And Matthew, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Merry Christmas once again. If you have your Bibles or if you have your notes, we're in Isaiah today in Matthew. You might be asking yourself, why are we preaching with one foot in the Old Testament and one foot in the New? And the reason for that is obviously Isaiah was the messianic prophet. He prophesied more about the coming of Jesus, the Savior, than any other prophet. And he uh, speaks to who Jesus was to be and become as he came to save this world. Uh, one of the things I love about this passage, let me tell you where we're going today. Let me just spoiler alert, okay? God is taking stumps and turning them into orchards, all right? He's taking stumps and he's turning them into orchards. And I think we had a word from Larry this morning was in the theme of that as well. Some of you feel like you're a stump. You're in a place of the stump. Uh, it's become petrified. You see uh, old stumps in fields can become petrified and they look like they're dead. And then sometimes uh, a root will, a branch will grow out of that stump and it'll grow into something. And that actually produces fruit and that fruit becomes an orchard. I think God wants to do that for a lot of us here. I think he wants to do it for all of us. I think God wants to continue to give us fruit. But there's been some that have maybe marriage didn't go the way they th thought it was going to go. Their relationship with their children, their business, their hopes, their dreams, their desires. Even their relationship with God hasn't become or gone to the place that they wanted it to, to go. It feels dried up. It feels barren and left behind. And in this passage, you see a family. What can happen to a family when God gets a hold of a family? You can see what happens to a family. You can see what happens to posterity when God gets a hold of a family. God got a hold of the family of Jesse, and through his son David, who was a stump of all his brothers, began to work within that stump, left out into the field by himself, forgotten. And some of you might feel left out and forgotten. But then again, God puts him on the mind of a prophet named Samuel, and Samuel's looking for a king of Israel, and Samuel starts going through all the sons of, of Jesse, and Really good looking ones, super tall ones, just amazing. And then he gets to the end. They didn't even invite David to the party. He said, well, don't you have another son? He says, yeah, you want to talk to him. He's out there in the field. He's the sh shepherd. That's the spies people that, that oftentimes were the shepherds. He says, well, bring him on in. Let me see what he looks like. And he's young and he's ruddy. I love that word ruddy, right? That ruddy word. And he comes in, and as soon as the prophet sees him, he says, that's, that's God's boy. That's my boy right there. You bring him here. And then they take that oil, and they anoint him. And it's not all perfection through David's life. But from David, and from more brokenness in his life, right, through his line, which goes through Solomon, which was a mistake in David's life, through Bathsheba, even through that stump, a tree being that you would think being cut down, God moves, he says, I'm going to redeem this. There is nothing in your life that is beyond redemption, and God wants to turn stumps into orchards, and that's where we're going today as we see this. We see a family tree from the, trump, from the stump of Jesse to the Savior of all, David's lineage, lineage produced Jesus' legacy. And that's what we want to do. We want to be the people who break the chain. We want to be the people or who continue on. If you have a legacy, maybe you have a grandma and some parents and you've been blessed with generational blessing that, that fills itself up in the heavens. Or maybe it's been just tapped dry. Maybe someone in your family has just used that credit card of emotions or whatever it is too many times and you feel you're just incredible debt. Well, Jesus came to pay all debts. And he came to turn stumps into orchards and to move that in our lives. So no matter what it is, whether it's a failure by you or whatever we see there, we see that God is in the place of doing that. We see a divine mission in these verses. 
we see a divine trio. And so one of the things, first thing, the first word the Lord has out of this is that God is going to turn stumps into orchards. Let me just show verse, 11, verse 1 and 2 in Isaiah. Let's look at the Isaiah passage. I don't want to go too far before we jump into the scripture. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch, that's a capital B there, why? Because that's speaking about Jesus, will bear fruit. So we're talking about posterity there. We're talking about change of a family. We're talking about an anointing on a family. And we see this passage actually fulfilled later on in Jesus' life in the Matthew passage. Because the spirit rests upon Jesus, it says like a dove. And it says here in this passage, if you go to the second part, verse 2 of Isaiah, go back to Isaiah. I know we're going back and forth. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. We see this prophecy fulfilled in this Matthew passage. One foot in the Old Testament, one foot in the New. First thing we see is the word God has out of this passage is it encouragement and a hope. You heard that from Alita today. You heard that from Larry on stage. We didn't conspire on what the message was going to be today. That's the first word. The second thing is how God's going to do it, a blueprint for orchards. You see, in these two passages, you see a blueprint for God producing orchards. Perhaps you just feel like it's a barren field right now and God wants to produce an orchard in your life. Here is how he does it. He does it through a divine trio. He does it through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, this passage leans heavily upon the Spirit. Uh, obviously, God is mentioned. In the Matthew pa passage, we see Jesus. We see the Spirit coming down, resting upon him like a dove. But then we also see the Father saying, this is my Son whom I loved and I am well pleased. And we have an affirming Father. Satan wants to say that your Father is upset. God the Father in heaven is upset with you. He's angry, he sees every mistake you make. I want to say God loves you because you are his creation. He made you in his image. You are the apple of his eye. He wants the best for you. And he says today to you, I love you and I care for you in the way that he said for his son. See a divine mission here. You see in your notes, I wrote this. In, this, in these verses, we see the divine trio. The spirit is anoints, anointing. The son fulfilling, doing what God told him to do in obedience. That's key to having an orchard. And the father affirming. The triune God here is working in perfect unity. We see a couple things happening. Here's, in the orchard life, the life that is going to take stumps and turn it into orchards in some of your lives, what it's going to take is obviously that obedience. It's going to take the father, the son, and the spirit. But he's going to take a presence, and that presence is going to manifest the fruit. You see, we can't manifest fruit in our life without the presence. And sometimes we just want to hide from that presence because we want ours. We're happy with a house plant. <laughs> and when we go our own way, when we don't cultivate the presence like you would cultivate an orchard through the word of God, through prayer, through obedience, if we're not cultivating the presence, maybe we end up with a house plant where God's like, hey, I want to take you further than that. And so we see God's presence. And out of the presence comes his manifestation. And you can rest and not have to work in that. I want to say, Charles Spurgeon said this. It takes the Trinity to make a Christian. It takes the Trinity to cheer a Christian. It takes the Trinity to complete a Christian. It takes the Trinity to create a Christian in the hope of his glory. It's getting in touch with Jesus. I don't know if you have a favorite member of the Trinity. I do, you know. I've had different favorite members. I started out with Jesus. Jesus was my, I was like, Jesus, he, I get him, he's cool, he looked like he was from the 70s, if he was going to drive like a cool van, like I would get in the van and roll around with him, and he was my bro, Jesus was my bro, right? Now I had it wrong, because he's a God of glory, but I didn't want nothing to do with that father stuff, because that didn't go so well for me in the beginning, so I pushed that father stuff aside, and then, then, I, met that, then I met the Holy Spirit, I got to a vineyard church after when I was like 20, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God came. I'm like, oh, I'm a Holy Spirit guy. Now, Jesus, I'll get back to you, but that Holy Spirit, I love that Spirit. Let's go. Let's see some healing. Let's make it happen. I still don't want none of that, Father. And then God began to take me at a season where he said, I want to show you how much I love you. I'm your Father. And then, you know, trying to live in the presence of those three. With that said, this passage in Matthew, while it affirms Jesus and the Father, these two passages really talk about the work of the Spirit. So we're going to get after the work of the Spirit today. Let's look at Isaiah's Holy Spirit here. 
While these two passages clearly speak of the Trinity, their message leans heavily towards the active work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus' followers. And so we're going to see that Isaiah's Holy Spirit is present and equipping. So as you see Isaiah, let's read through Isaiah because go to verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord, who's doing the work there? You? No, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Circle rests. That's how the Holy Spirit works. He has power. Two words for power for the Holy Spirit are dunamis. It's like miracle work in power. And kratos, which is power, which is taking more territory, emotional territory, geographical territory, and the city in which you live. God wants to move in that. It says that um, in verse 2, we'll rest upon him. Now, you have three ways the Spirit works here. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of power. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. First thing I noticed here as I was reading in Isaiah verse 2, and you're going to see this backed up in the Matthew passage, is just the nature of the Spirit. The Spirit will come upon and beat Jesus down and just hit him with power and a, and a, and a high five. No, the Spirit will rest upon him. See, the Spirit oftentimes, when we're cultivating that orchard life, we want to do things in, out of frustration. We want to do things out of anger. We want to do things out of just dopamine hits, we want to do things out of energy, we want to do things on our timing and that whole thing. What we see here is a spirit that rests. Then you get to the Matthew passage, right? And I would send a lion, wouldn't you? Like out of the, out of the thicket. If, I was, if Jesus was getting baptized and I was God, thankfully I'm not, but if I was God, I want, I want to impress people. I want to bring out the, man, they had lions in Israel back in the time. You could have brought out a lion to roar and ah, you know. It's not what we're getting with the Spirit. The Spirit of God rests. The Spirit comes on Jesus when we see this passage being lived out after Jesus is obedient. Remember, be, obedience is a fertilizer for God's orchard. That God rests and he brings a dove. I say one of the ways when you have to make a decision, follow the peace. Follow the peace. I would say one of the things I, I, I have found is sometimes I'll, everything will look great. But there is a thing that says in the scripture that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The peace. There, we, had, we had options to do this and this at this church. A lot of times I just sit, I'll just know. If I can just get quiet enough. That's why the devil always wants you here and running and moving. Because he's got to keep you distracted and moving so that you don't get a sense of that peace. The spirit, the first thing we see, if you want to have an orchard life, slow down, wait for the peace, wait for the gentle, yes. We see that in both. He rests and he comes as a dove. So also look, it's present. I said again, Isaiah's Holy Spirit is present and equipping. In both Isaiah and Matthew, we see the Holy Spirit is equipping. We also see this on the day of Pentecost. And so the Holy Spirit is coming. And when Jesus comes out of the water here, what does Jesus do? He immediately gets to ministry. Out of this passage, once the, where the Spirit equips, the Spirit is going to send. And where the Spirit sends, he will equip you in advance for that sending. Jesus gets to the business of ministry as soon as the Spirit of God descends upon him in this place. He steps out of that water and into ministry. Now we see the same thing with the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 2, right? When did they really get to the business of taking the gospel to the world? to a pagan and oftentimes hostile world. They did it after the Spirit of God came and lit upon their shoulders as tongues of fire and they were equipped and they went out and they were sent. I would say being equipped oftentimes is about a heart's attitude and waiting in his presence and God will equip you. He gives you gifts. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not doing things like taking a spiritual gift test going to seminary like Joshua did and some others, or being in an intern program and learning things. We're doing those things. But it is the presence that equips. And a lot of times we just want the degree. We want, it, we want, we want the accolades. We want, we want to do the hard work. But sometimes the hardest work is just being in the presence. And when we're in the presence, it's equipped. If you want that orchard life, it's waiting and being in that presence. And we see that that happens and then God equips the spirit of, there's two things that it says, and I'll just break these down real quick. First of all, in Isaiah, go back to the Isaiah passage. Verse 2, the Lord will rest on him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding. What does that mean? Wisdom and understanding. 
Wisdom means knowing what to do. Understanding is knowing how to do. Okay? Now, just because you have wisdom doesn't mean that you're going to do the right thing. Look at Solomon. He's the wisest man, the Bible says, that ever was and ever will be. God gave him godly wisdom. And he said to him, at, the, the first thing he said to him was, I just got a little caveat for you. Don't take any foreign wives. <laughs> okay? Just, just one little thing. You got all this wisdom. The first verse, after he is given that command, and God says, I will expand your kingdom and this whole deal. The first verse after that says, and Solomon went and took a wife from the Pharaoh, from the king of Egypt. I'm like, what's up, you fool? I mean, just because what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing what to do. And God will give wisdom. This is the right thing to do. When you don't know what to do, one of the things I would encourage you is just get into the word until you find the right thing to do. The word, will, the word will enlighten that for you. And then understanding is how to do it. The Holy Spirit here, this is so key for us. Because how many times have you known the right thing to do and done it wrong? You did the right thing, but you did it wrong. Just get married. You'll figure that out real quick, right? I, what I said was right, but it's how you said it. <laughs> it's how you said it. What it says is that the Spirit of God, when it's on Jesus, Jesus knew what to do, and he knew how to do it. He knew how to look at people when they said something that was true about him. He said, shh, shh, shh. don't tell nobody that. Keep that quiet. That doesn't make any sense, Jesus. If I'm his handler, if I'm his, you know, I'm his publicity agent, don't tell people not to, you know, speak about who you are. But he tells us when to be silent. Jesus is falling because Jesus practices the presence. And then the presence, he learns what to do, and then he learns how to do it. Don't move. Don't move on a decision. Don't move on a relationship. Don't move on a financial investment. Don't move on hiring somebody for your team. Don't move until you know what to do, until you know how to do it, until you feel a peace rest upon you. If you have those three things happening, I've got to tell you, you are going to start seeing a branch come from the stump that might be your life, that might be your family, that will produce fruit, and it will begin to produce an orchard. And I say orchards don't grow in a day. It is repetition over and over and over. So we see spirit of wisdom and understanding. We see a spirit of counsel and of power. I love that, spirit of counsel. The Holy Spirit wants to counsel you, but we have to slow down to take that counsel. It says in James to ask of the Lord for wisdom who is generous and gives to all who ask, and he's pleased to do it. How often when you have a decision do you say, God, give me wisdom on this, and then you're willing to wait. God, show me how to do this. I can say to this point, I have never had a time in my life that I can remember where I have asked God, been willing to wait, and not gotten an answer. Now, it might not be the right answer, but that answer, when you follow it, oftentimes opens doors. I told you how I've been struggling with my basketball addiction, okay, my part of my daughter's team. We got good minutes last night, played well, it was awesome. But last week, I just what I, I kind of stepped out, I told you two weeks ago, kind of stepped out, didn't, it wasn't, wasn't the person, it wasn't bad, super bad, but it was like, ah, that wasn't great. And it's like something said, I was like, Lord, how do I fix this? Because it was bugging me, right? Something's in my head. I had this kind of, you know, um, discussion with, with somebody in the program and it wasn't going great. And I was like, Lord, what do you want to do? He says, I want you to just write an apology text. Short. I don't need to write, I don't write text this long. Just apology, ask forgiveness. I was like, oh, that hurts, oh, no. It's like, you remember Witch Hazel? Did you guys have Witch Hazel as a kid? It was like that alcohol, you remember? My grandma, she's from back east, she had Witch Hazel. I get a cut, she poured on there, ah, you know, it's like iodine. Lord said, this is the word you, I'm, and I had a little sentence in there that was kind of like, yeah, but I'm going to give you a little bit of that, you know what I'm saying, at the time when I give you that. Lord said, take that out. I was like, delete, delete, delete. Just send the repentant. And I, so I sent it. I wasn't happy I sent it. It didn't feel good to send it. It wasn't like a, a release. A person came up to me afterwards uh, that night at the game. They're like, hey, I got your checks. Thanks so much. That meant so much to me. I really appreciate that. Like, it's not a big deal. Thank you. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, 
all of a sudden there's relational power again. The doors are open to emotional relationship again, to sharing Christ with that person again. All of a sudden it's open. But what did I want to do? No. You know what I'm saying? Because that's power. What is power? There's two types of power. that I Well, there's more than two types, but there's that dunamis power that I'm going to raise the dead, and then there's that territorial kratos. Sandra Munson got me a kratos hat. Yeah, that says, I'll, I, I'll bring it next service. But it was like, boom, so you got this hat that says kratos. Just taking territory for Jesus. You see that in the Isaiah passage. Let's go back to that. He said, a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And then in order, I think on purpose, the spirit of counsel and of power. When does the power come? After you take the counsel. We just want the power, right? We just want the power. Do it, live my life however I want and bring me the power. But what we see here is it comes after you take the wisdom, after the resting, after the listening, after the seeking the wisdom. It says through many advisors, victory is won. Do you see the order? It didn't start with the power. God doesn't need to start with power. He can start with a stump. He can start with a stump and take the cosmos back and redeem all from sin through the blood of Jesus. He can do that. Do we believe it? And then finally there, it says the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The spirit of knowledge and, the, and, and, and knowledge, God, know, God, God has all knowledge. I think it's interesting the last thing he gives you is the knowledge. <laughs> Why? Because we serve a God, we, we serve a God who, who wants faith. <laughs> He's, he wants you to step out. He wants you to listen. He wants you to be obedient. Jesus could have said, why do I need to get baptized? What's the point? I'm Jesus. I've never sinned. I don't need my sin. Why? As an example to us. And if you've not been baptized, I want to challenge you, get baptized. we got baptismal right there if you don't know it. We will do it. We had probably 30 people get baptized this year, the most since I've been here. God's moving and continue to do that. We continue to see that there's a spirit of knowledge. God will begin to show you why he did what he did. He'll begin to show you, you look at things happening in the world, and as we wait, we listen, we get away from our emotions. He'll begin to say, this is why I'm doing this. This is why this is happening. This is why this happened. And he begins to share with you his knowledge, and with that, that brings a fear of the Lord, just a reverence. What does fear mean? It's not terrified of God. It means I have a reverence. God, you're so good. I revere you, God. You want to know the best attitude that I can have and I love having? I'm just a stump. God, I'm just a stump that you're going to make an orchard out of. And that reverence and that fear, it's just coming to the Lord as a stump. God, I, everyone wants to be the orchard, right? Everyone wants to produce everything. The more, I, the more I realize I'm a stump, and I'm not talking negative self-talk. I'm talking, God, I'm a stump, but I'm beloved by you, and I only have meaning because of you and because you bring fruit into my life, your goodness, God. That, I'm, you know, that brings that fear of the Lord. You see that, that, how that works there. And then just in closing, look at, let's look at Matthew's Holy Spirit. Remember, we're focusing on the Spirit. All three are here in this Trinity passage as Jesus is fulfilling the Isaiah passage right here in, in, before our eyes in Matthew 3. I love that we, uh, let's go to verse 16. As soon, circle soon, as Jesus was baptized, something happened right after the obedience. He went up, circle up, out of the water. At that moment, mm, circle moment, you see the timing happening here? You see all that timing? Heaven was opened. Mm. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and lighting upon him. First thing I see is the Spirit that orchestrates our lives. Do you see the timing? Do you see these things happen? Jesus could have got to it when he was 13 years old. Jesus could have got to it when he was probably nine years old. It said he grew in spirit and, and, and he grew in his wisdom and understanding so God made him a baby that's a stump right who sends a baby to do a job right a God who doesn't need power who sends him into a hostile environment a God that's willing to work with stumps and have him grow but we see here that there's an orchestration and the spirit begins to move as soon as Jesus was baptized there was a moment of time and in that moment bam God moved and maybe you're waiting for God to move I say certain things can increase God's timing, can, can speed up God's timing. I was frustrated we weren't getting things accomplished here at the church doors. We have a, di we have a different problem here at this church. We have tons of, op we have tons of, of, of um, 
people and, and, and that want to do things and the resource to go do things. And a lot of times we just haven't had the opportunity. We've been wanting to start a school. We've been wanting to do all these things. And the opportunity hasn't come. A lot of people have opportunity, but they don't have the resource. Most of that's people resource of us and people that are excited. And we're waiting. So we decided to fast. You know what's interesting? I have a little crew in, within you, you guys, that kind of, they got me on their text chain somehow. I don't know how to do it. They got my number. I don't know how Devin and Eden and those other people got my number, but they got it somehow. And Becca. So we were fasting together as part of the fast. We were just in a crew, kind of keeping each other up to date, what's happening. We found out at the end that all of us had 25% of our prayer requests from the Daniel fast answered. That's, that's a 25% return on a 21-day fast. Now, if you're in business, i got to say that's solid. That's one out of every four requests. And I had, I had a grip of requests. My whole request was this long, beginning to step into that. And all of a sudden, God's timing started to move. We started to see things happen. See, those are some of the things you can do to nurture that timing. It says, as soon Jesus went up, I like how he's going up, out of, and at that moment, what happened? There's the second thing we see. It says that at that moment, heaven was opened. We serve a God of an open heaven. We want to do things that open windows in heaven. We want to do things that bring ladders like we see. Jacob's ladder we see. We want to do things that open up heaven. Prayer opens up heaven. Obedience opens up heaven. We serve a God of an open heaven who wants to bless you and rain down upon you with dunamis and kratos and power and love and mercy. And we see it happen in Jesus when Jesus was obedient, when Jesus took time and in God's timing, all of a sudden, bam, God moves. And we have a God of an open heaven. And I love that. Satan wants you to think heaven's closed. God's forgotten about you. You're a stump out in Middle of nowhere, nothing happening. It hasn't been rain for weeks. But we serve a God of open heaven. Begin to move into these principles. This is, this is a farmer's almanac to how to create an orchard in your life. And the final thing is this. We see a spirit of affirmation. Here we experience the affirmation of God. This is my son whom I love. And with him I am well pleased. And I want to say it's easier for me sometimes to have faith that Jesus died on the cross and save me from my sins than it is for me to believe that. Some of you don't need faith to go to heaven. You got that. You need faith to believe that Jesus loves you deeply, that you are cherished by him, that you are the apple of his eye, that he cares for you. Despite all your wrongs, he died on the cross for that, and he wants the best for you. That is a game-changing understanding of who he is talked about a family that was changed um, in 1940. Here's a picture of a woman named Corey Ten Boom. 1940, Corey Ten Boom was a watchmaker. She was younger, and uh, she was the first female watchmaker in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands were taken over by the Nazis. And um, she had had a, a Bible club that she had started. And she was in the schools doing a faith club like we had. We had um, at, at the two different schools right now that we have. And people knew about it. And when there was people that didn't have home, somewhere to live, they would take them into their home. And so when the Nazi occupation came, uh, some Jews who were displaced came to her and we said, we've heard you taking people into your home. Would the Ten Booms mind taking us in? And they said at their own risk, yeah, we'll, we'll take you in. And so she took the first woman in with her suitcase and pretty soon they brought an architect and they built a, a hiding place. And then her book is called The Hiding Place. And they built this hiding place in her house. And in that hiding place, um, over the time as she became part of the Dutch resistance, sharing Christ, many of those people that, she, that stayed with her became Christians. They rescued over 800 Jews from Nazi death camps. Eventually, they were turned in by another Dutchman who turned them in, and the Nazis came and took the Ten Booms away with her sister, Betsy, to a concentration camp, and they ended up, I believe it was at Buchenwald. And when they were there, um, her sister ended up getting sick, and she began to they had smuggled a Bible in, and, they, and Corey was, was, was doing Bible studies in the concentration camp, and people were getting saved in the concentration camp, and maybe you know the story. And right before there was a clerical error that allowed Corey to be released, her sister came to her, who was very sick at the time, and her sister said, no matter how deep the deepest pit of Satan and darkness is, God is deeper, and we can find him there. Twelve days later, her sister passed away in that camp, and Corey was released. Ten days after that, the entire group of women that Corey was with were sent to the gas chambers. Corey went on to survive Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Corey went on to write books. 
Corey went on to go all over the world, and many of you know her name today because God took an insignificant little watchmaker that was just a stump, who was faithful, who was willing to risk, who was willing to have courage, and turned her into an orchard. And I speak about her today, and you're blessed today because of a decision to say we're going to shrink our comfort zone, we're going to follow God, and we're going to expand his kingdom. I want to lead a church of people who are full of fruit. I want to lead a church of people, all different types of trees in this congregation, but changing the world, changing La Jolla, because there are people out there that are starving. There are people out there that are starving, and I want us to get our eye on the kingdom and realize that Jesus Christ can take us to that next level. Amen?